welcome everybody. Um, this is be a really great program. Uh, this is some of my books you can see there, but let's just jump into why we're here. These are some of the other titles. Um, I've written probably 25 books and Titanic was one that um, really, uh, I was, when I started to think about writing it, um, I felt like, you know, everything had been covered. And uh, we're living in sort of a time of where a lot of myths are being torn down, uh, mythology is being torn down. And so with Titanic, I really felt like I had to come in a new way. And fortunately, through wireless telegraphy, uh, which we're going to talk about more, obviously, um, I really found my way into the Titanic story. So I know a lot of you out there have seen the movie Titanic. This is sort of the, what you haven't heard. Now, when my book came out, it was the 110th anniversary of Titanic. So World News Tonight asked if they could interview me on my thesis. Uh, and uh, so I said, sure. And so I'm just going to, we're going to lead off. I'm going to roll that clip, kind of give you an intro to the story, to me, and then we're going to jump right into Titanic. Whatever you think you know about the Titanic, the king of the world! think again. Everyone could have been saved on Titanic if it were not for human failing. On the 110th anniversary of its sinking, a new book says that all of those lives lost could have been spared. What I uncovered was the fact that, you know, these two ships were, one was about five miles away, one was 10 miles, and that, in fact, they could have come in and and rescued these people and they did not author william hazelgrove diving into the research all these passengers who got off to california and the mount temple they all talked to different newspapers different reporters in canada and the united states and they all said the same thing they said we saw the ship it was right there the rms californian commanded by captain stanley lord and he says no no that's a russian fishing trawler and we aren't going in his crew watching as the Titanic sent up rockets in distress, all within just miles. Captain Smith is on board the Titanic telling the people in the boat, see that light, see that light, row toward that light. Why is this the first that I'm hearing that everybody could have survived? Well, you know, history's written by the victors. In this case, it's 1955's A Night to Remember by Walter Lord and the 1958 movie by the same name. Iceberg, get ahead, sir! But the truth, according to Hazel Grove, is that Captain Lord and Captain James Henry Moore of the Temple, also nearby, could have rescued the 1,500 people who lost their lives so many years ago today. Here in New York City, this park is dedicated to Ida and Isidore Strauss. Ida was offered a spot on lifeboat number eight, but declined to get on board, wanting to stay by her husband's side. Now, all these years later, the legend of the Titanic endures. And maybe in those wireless coils, down on the bottom of the ocean, when they pull it up, there'll be one last message embedded in there. And you can bet it's probably that universal question that we still ask today, especially today, will you come help us? Captain Lord of the RMS Californian was later found guilty in British and American inquiries of not going to rescue a ship in distress. And he was disgraced, stripped of his titles. You can find 160 Minutes, The Race to Save the RMS Titanic, anywhere books are sold. Will they ever find the heart of the ocean or? <laughs> it's been 87 years. Does he have any theories? 84 years. <laughs> I mean, this was a fascinating conversation, yeah. and I can't wait to read this book. Absolutely. Yeah. No, in all seriousness, this was, what, the worst maritime disaster, especially at the time, uh, ever. Yeah. Oh. I have Jack a child. Rose. Billy Zane. Billy Zane. <laughs> okay, so that gives you a little background um, on the story, but let's jump right into, uh, right into the story. Now, basically, one reason that uh, I called this book 160 Minutes is because it was 160 Minutes after they struck the iceberg that she sank two hours and 40 minutes so that's really all the time they had to you know get some ship to rescue them and there was a big rescue operation uh that's what most people don't know there was a huge rescue operation but let's start in the beginning in the beginning um there's a lot of mythology associated with titanic um and so we're going to talk about the mythology first and then we're going to jump into the real story um in 1915 there was a fisherman who was fishing off the coast of New Jersey. 
Um, I'm in Chicago, by the way. And uh, and so he sees this bottle, you know, with the message inside. And he opens it up and it says, from Titanic, goodbye all, Burke of Glenmere Cork. Well, he thinks, okay, so Burke of Glenmere Cork was going down with the Titanic and he threw this bottle off into an infinity. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's how it came to be. Well, if you did some research, there is no Burke of Glenmere Cork on Titanic. There's a total joke. But that didn't stop other bottles from popping up with these strange messages. And this story making it into Titanic history books. Um, and that's just because the mythology of Titanic is so big. And why not? Look at the size of this ship. Nobody had built anything like it. It was the largest ship, most technologically advanced. It was their space shuttle of their time. So, so you know, everything adhered to it. It, it was the best the fastest, the most luxurious, and it was unsinkable. And so why wouldn't you have big movies that would push this story out? So now there were three movies. Uh, the first one you probably don't know about. The first one was made right after it. It was a silent movie. And believe it or not, the actress that was in it was on Titanic and she survived. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. It was one of those nitrate films that probably spontaneously combusted sometime. Um, but, but then there was another film in 1957 that came out. Now, this film was based on this guy's book. All right, here's Walter Lord. Now, Walter Lord is a copywriter in New York. And he's like, okay, um, I'm going to write a book on Titanic. And so he does, um, now, maybe somebody read the book. Um, he, and so what he did was he, he interviewed the survivors of Titanic. Um, they were still alive, which was good for Walter Lurk, something I could never do, um, obviously. Uh, and so he, he produces his book. And it's a little book. It's right here. All right. A Night to Remember. And this book becomes the foundation of all history books on Titanic. At the Bottom of every history book that comes along is Walter Lord's book. His book is not footnoted. It's only 112 pages. And it's sort of a you are there story. So he interviewed the survivors um, and they just told their story. And they're mostly first class survivors. So it's really a first class story of Titanic. And this is this happens in history. I wrote a book on the Wright brothers, Wright brothers, wrong story. And that in the Wright brother mythology is based on a book by a guy named Fred Kelly, published in 1941. Um, so there's always sort of a smoking gun to history where mythology creeps in and changes the facts. Now, and it's not so much that Lord was wrong, it's just who he focused on. Now, these two people you see here, uh, they are survivors from the Carpathia. It's an actual photo, and they're a honeymoon couple. And they're on their honeymoon in the Titanic sun. They don't look like they got too wet, do they? That's because they didn't. They were one of the few who made it into the 20 lifeboats. Um, and again, these are the people that Lord spoke with, and they give him their view. But there is a real story of Titanic. And again, one final shot of the size of this ship that, again, you know, this dwarfed people. And so, again, this even before this ship, you know, hit the water, there was all sorts of mythology around it, how it's the most amazing, luxurious ship of them all. All right, so now my book, I count down uh, the 160 minutes. That's what we're going to do here as we go through the presentation. So 11.40 p.m., April 14th, 1912, Titanic hits a 500 billion ton iceberg. Now, this is a photo of the supposed iceberg Titanic hit. Okay, now here's something you should know. If Titanic had banged into this iceberg dead on, you've all seen the movie where, you know, the Two men in the crow's nest go, iceberg dead ahead. And then, you know, up on the bridge, they reverse the engines and crank over to starboard. Well, the problem is Titanic's rudder was too small for the size of the ship. And when they reverse the engines, the current started to cavitate around the rudder. So Titanic turned very slowly. If Titanic had just bashed into the iceberg, if let's say the, the two men in the crow's nest got drunk and you know, fell asleep or whatever, 
her bow would have been crushed, but she would have remained, uh, remained afloat. Why? Because Titanic could float with four compartments flooded, but not five. And the chances of four compartments being flooded were pretty remote. Five was almost an impossibility. But if Titanic had just hit it stead on, it may have flooded the first two or three compartments, but that would have stopped it. But she didn't. She turned. And as she turned, that, uh, that iceberg ripped along five compartments, just tearing open Titanic. And again, this is a 500 billion ton iceberg. So it'd be like me going into the Sears Tower with a tricycle. Titanic was destined to lose. Now, maybe some of you have been on a cruise ship before. Um, I have. And you know that the drill is you, you, know, you have a big meal, usually a five, six, seven course meal. And then you go to a show or you go have a few drinks. Then you go walk around, you know, the promenade or the deck, and then you go to bed. Well, on this night, April 14th, which we just passed, right, um, it was bitterly cold, very, very cold. And so people, after having these big meals, did not go outside and walk around. They pretty much went back to their staterooms and got in under their White Star blankets, turned on their electric heaters. Now, here's what's interesting. Most people did not hear a thing when Titanic hit that iceberg. Uh, one woman said it sounded like calico tearing. Another woman said she it sounded like marbles outside the uh, you know the deck or outside the hull. Um, Lawrence Beasley, a schoolmaster, said you know his water glass started to shake strangely. Some people said they felt it in the bathtub as they were laying back. Uh, one gentleman's port the porthole was open. Ice fell into his room. Some people went outside and saw ice on the deck, scooped it up and put in their drinks. So most people did not know Titanic can hit anything. And this has contributed to a lot of people not wanting to get into the life beds. Um, but she did hit something. What most people heard was the engines. Okay, so now when you're on a cruise, uh, you, you always feel sort of the thrum of the engines down below, right? You're moving, you, you feel the engines. Titanic, same thing. They hit the iceberg. Titanic stopped, started, and then stopped. A lot of people thought she threw a propeller. Okay, so but this was the thing that mostly told people, hey, something's going on. All right, so then what happens next? At 1141, they closed the watertight doors. Now, here's a picture of it. Let's talk about these. The watertight doors are the reason everybody said Titanic was unsinkable. Um, and this created a lot of problems. First of all, in the movie, you see him come out. Did you shut the watertight doors? Yes, I did. Okay, so they hit the switch. The watertight doors roll up. So what's that do? I right, so you have bulkheads that separate all the different parts of the ship. These watertight doors go up, and in theory, they seal off the bulkhead. And that should stop the water from coming in. Okay, the problem is, in Titanic, the bulkheads only went up to D-deck. And D-deck was not high enough. So when the water came in, it starts to pull the bow down of the ship, all right? So the water then goes up and over, up and over, up and over. Now, if only three or four compartments have been flooded, mathematically, there have been enough weight in Titanic to stop her from going down, all right? So then it would have sort of hit a, a buoyant point where the water stopped going over. But because there were five compartments flooded, it's too much weight. And so like a canoe with a big anchor in the front, it plunges down, the water goes up and over. Think of this this way. Let's say you're in your living room watching TV and you left the windows open in your bedroom and a huge monsoon hits your house. And all that water pours into the bedroom and rises up and comes over the ceiling into the living room. Well, that's what happened with Titanic. It just went up and over, up and over. This is why architect Andrews could say to Captain Smith, she will founder. She'll be at the bottom of the Atlantic in two hours. Because he knew once all those compartments had been breached, the water was going to just keep coming in. The pumps could not keep up with it. So in 1985, they found Titanic, as you know, down on the bottom of the Atlantic. And the first thing they want to do is see what happened to the hull. But Titanic was dug into the sand. So they sent an underwater sonar robot down there and it shot pictures. And what it saw was six slits below the waterline. 
and that allowed the 39,000 tons of water to pour in. So the, it was she was mortally wounded. It was sort of a perfect storm of 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 a crash. You know, if anything else had changed, Titanic wouldn't have sunk. But because she scraped the iceberg, she got opened up and she was mortally wounded. But this also contributed to people thinking Titanic was fine because. If the wound was invisible. Titanic wasn't going down that fast. It was listing slightly. So a lot of people thought, oh, this is just a drill. You know, we this really isn't going to happen. So at 12.05, Captain Smith orders the lifeboats uncovered. Okay, let's talk about this. Now, the crew is pulled from a lot of different ships, and they have never worked together before. All right, this is a maiden voyage. And Captain Smith is like a duck hit on the head. He's very slow to react. And second officer Lightteller says, sir, we should get the lifeboats uncovered. Finally, he says, okay, uncover the lifeboats. So they do. The problem is, though, is that people do not understand how to work together to get these lifeboats out and over. And this will contribute to all sorts of problems, also loading problems. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Now, the next thing Captain Smith does at 12 tenants, he goes down to what's called the silent room. The, now, this is how I begin my book because I got into this through wireless technology. At the time, wireless telegraphy was brand new. Um, the ability to send a wireless signal from a ship was very, very new. And this is something Marconi had done. He put these sets onto these ships, all right? It's a lot like the internet in the 80s when people didn't understand it. And a lot of people thought it was a gadget. Well, that's what, how people viewed wireless telegraphy. On Titanic, there are two operators, and they work 24-7. They take their meals there. They don't come out of the silent room. The reason they call it the silent room is they use direct current to transmit these signals, and it has to be amped up voltage-wise to get these signals out. So it's very loud when the key hits it. It actually cracks. Um, also, they have to be able to hear the sound coming in. So it's an insulated room. All right, so Captain Smith goes down there to these two 20-somethings who he hasn't really had much conversation with. Again, he's a 30-year veteran. He's crossed the Atlantic many times. He doesn't need this new technology to tell him where the ice warning, the ice, um, the icebergs are because there have been lots of ice warnings that they've been giving him, and, he, and they've been pretty much ignored. He altered the ship's course slightly, just a little more south, but it wasn't much. It wasn't enough. Um, now, these two operators, and here they are, there's Jack Phillips, who's on the left here. He's the senior operator. And then there's Harold Bride, who's the junior operator. Now, they send out a signal during the day. That signal will only go 500 miles. But at night, when the air is bitterly cold, it bounces off the ionosphere and goes 2,000 miles. Titanic had the most powerful wireless set you can have on a ship, All right? So this new technology is very powerful, but it's mostly being used for passengers because that's where Marconi makes his money. So somebody in the middle of the Atlantic can go, hey, Joe, I'm in the middle of the Atlantic. Let's do lunch when I get to New York. That's what it's used for primarily. It's it's a luxury item. It's, it's sort of a gadget. Um, again, the crew and Captain Smith do not take it seriously. But now he realizes, hey, you know, I need this. I need to have ships coming to help us. And so now he suddenly realizes that everybody's lives depends on these two 20-somethings. So at 12.15, the first CQD goes out, the come quick distress. And this technology is such a you just keep sending it out over and over and over and over, all right? So it just keeps going out. Imagine this ship in the middle of the Atlantic, in the middle of the night, on a very calm night on the Atlantic, on a very cold night, and these signals are bouncing off the ionosphere, which, by the way, they didn't even know what it was called then, you know, for 2,000 miles. So they're bouncing off. And here's another big mythology of Titanic, was that she was out there all alone. Titanic was not alone. There's 10 ships out there. Okay, so these 10 ships are picking up her signals. This is the only actual photo we have of the wireless room. That's Harold Bride sitting there sending out signals. It's double exposed. That's why it's kind of ghostly. But it's the only actual photo we have of the Titanic wireless room. Now, you think, okay, it's these beeps. The Morse code is sort of beeps and dashes and pauses. But it's not really that at all. 
it's actually very fast and it's a lot of static and you have to be able to decipher this very quickly as it comes in. Also, it's one-way communication. They don't have the ability, like on a phone, you can talk two ways. It's like, hey, what are you doing? And then somebody come right back. If you're transmitting out, you can't hear somebody transmitting back. And they can't afford to wait for people to transmit back. So they have to go on faith that somebody's getting these signals. So the question is, what is what do these signals sound like? Well, we're going to actually hear them right now. We're going to show you what Titanic's distress signals sounded like. Imagine getting that over and over and over and having to decipher that at lightning speed. And that's what they have to do. Um, this is a very grueling job. You know, you, again, you have 12 hours off, and then you'd sleep, and you get 12 hours on. Um, all right, now, this photo here is very unique. Why? Because it's the only photo of Titanic that shows the antenna up there. Anything else, any other photos you see of Titanic, you don't see any antenna. But you can see why it could transmit so far because of those four, the four lines up at the top. And again, it went 2,000 miles at night, which is a very long distance for this time in 1912. Now, they're shore stations. And shore stations would pick up the relays and then relay it on, all right? Pick up the signal, relay it on, or they'd be sending out information to Titanic, Titanic and other ships. Now, Titanic had big printing presses, which basically would allow Titanic to have its own newspaper, which was an amazing thing. So at the shore station, they could actually send out, you know, information, tell them what's going on in the world and the Chicago Cubs or, you know, are doing. And people could read it in the morning over their newspaper, have their coffee. Um, and this was amazing to people. Now, at this shore station in Nova Scotia, these... These stations are studies in isolation. There's, there's uh, nobody comes out to see them. They eat there, they sleep there. And at this station, there's two adults and a 14 year old boy named Jimmy Merrick. And so what happens? The two adults go out and start working on the generators. And they leave Jimmy Merrick and just say, hey, Dirk, don't do anything, just sit here. Well, he does. And he hears all of a sudden, you know, these signals come in. He deciphers them in his Titanic, saying, come quickly, we're sinking. They hit an iceberg. He runs and gets the adults. They come in. They confirm it. And they turn to him and say, look, don't tell anybody that you heard this, that we weren't here. We would lose our jobs. And so Jimmy Merritt stayed quiet for like 50 years before he finally told a newspaper that he, in fact, was one of the first people to hear Titanic sink. Was thinking. Okay, now here's some actual transmissions received by the Mount Temple. Now, the Mount Temple is commanded by Captain Moore. Mount Temple is actually very close to Titanic, about 40 miles, and it's the first ship to get her signals. And you see here, CQD, CQD, this is Titanic that gives a position. All right, now, the Frankfurt's a German liner. It says, what's the matter? This is Titanic, gives position. Okay, stand by. This is Titanic. Mount Temple, what's the matter? Cannot read you, old man, but here's my position. So they can't even hear people responding. They can hear some clicking. It tells them, you know, somebody's responding. Have struck a bird, we'll receive, we'll, cap, we'll tell captain. So there is some communication there, but mostly not. Mostly not. So what, what does the Mount Temple do? The Mount Temple turns around and starts right for Titanic immediately to try and get there. Um, they, put, they set up a triage station. Um, they're, and they're trying desperately to get there as fast as they can. 
Um, so actually the Mount Temple has a very good chance of getting there. Now here's her location, all right, right here. And you can kind of see her location in relation to Titanic. Um, and again, you know, people, uh, the, the wireless operators, nobody really understands how close the ships are or how far they're going on phase. And they're hoping against hope that they'll get there. Now, again, let's talk about wireless. Wireless was the internet at the time, and it was set up for the passengers, but it wasn't set up for the crew. So what happened with these famed ice warnings that you know Captain Smith and others pretty much ignored was there was no system for them to even get them. Uh, Harold Bride or would you know run since he was a junior op operator, he'd run them up to the bridge. He'd hand them to whoever's on watch, but a lot of times they would you know, put them on a bulletin board or not, or just lay them there. Unfortunately, sometimes it's somebody put them in their pocket. It's actually, that's what happened with Captain Smith. He put one in his pocket. So they, they weren't viewed as critical information. They were viewed as, okay, this new gadget, these guys who don't even work for White Star, they work for Marconi. Um, they're bringing up these warnings, but you know what? We know how to go through an ice field. And by the way, the way um, ships went through ice fields at the time, was to go as fast as possible, about 24 knots. Now, here's a replica of the wireless room. So it's much clearer than that uh, photo. Um, and so, you know, this shows you it looks like old technology, old technology to us, but this was actually the cutting edge technology. Now, I like this next uh, illustration. It's an old illustration, but it shows how many ships were around Titanic. Look at all those ships around her. And they all turned around and started coming right for Titanic. Um, they all flipped around. The minute they got the signal, they started racing toward Titanic. So this is a rescue operation. Now, Titanic has a sister ship, the Olympic. Same size, a little smaller, but almost identical. She, too, has a very powerful wireless set. But she's 500 miles away, 505 miles away. And so, you know, she can hear Titanic's in trouble, and they do turn around and start heading for him, but the best she can do is relay the information she's getting from Titanic onto other people. Um, but again, you know, nobody knows how long Titanic has, except the people on board Titanic. Um, and so these ships are coming as fast as they can. Now, I want you to look closely at this slide. Um, this actually are the lifeboats from Titanic, the Carpathia picked up. Now, there's they, they dropped them at the dock in New York. So look at how reinforced they are. Look at how big they are. 75 people could sit in these lifeboats. These are ocean-going lifeboats. Look at how reinforced they are, okay? Because what's going to happen next is it's going to really factor into one of the big arguments of Titanic. So these are very substantial lifeboats, okay? Now, here's where it gets interesting. This is a ship called the California. Now, the California is commanded by a guy named Captain Lord. And Captain Lord is an old school captain, very imperious. You know, his rule is law. Okay. Titanic hit an ice field. It didn't just hit an iceberg. So that means there's lots of smaller bergs. They're called growlers. Uh, it's very treacherous. Okay. Captain Lord hits the same ice field. He's 10 miles from Titanic, and he stops his ship. And he has no idea what's going on with Titanic at all at this point. At this point, Titanic hasn't hit the iceberg. Okay. Lord stops his ship, says we aren't going any further, and shuts it down. He has one wireless operator. Here he is. And so, you know, he only is going to work so long and then go to bed. Now, when these ships get close together, um, it's like a radio being turned up. You ever get in your car and somebody leaves a radio up, uh, then suddenly you're like, oh my God, I'm getting blasted out. Okay. When the ships get close and these wireless operators transmit, if they're really close, it, it's very loud in their headset. So he has some messages for Titanic and he sends them. And Jack Phillips, who has a stack of passenger messages and is working his way through, snaps back him and says, shut up, shut up, you're jamming me. Basically tells him, don't bother me, I'm, I, I can't deal with you right now. This guy in California has had a long day. 
And he's tired. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to bed. I'll deal with this later. And so he turns off his set. So now the Californian is asleep. Okay? For all practical purposes, she's just sitting dead in the water, not moving, and her wireless is turned off. But on Titanic, everybody can see him. They're only 10 miles away. So they see the ship's lights. And Captain Smith, says to people in the lifeboats as they load them in, see that light, see that light, row toward that light. Second officer light taller says the same thing. Jack Thayer, who would later write a book, he and his mother and his father, they all see the light because they're all getting in lifeboats. Um, uh, Lawrence Beasley, he sees the light. It, it's Everybody sees these lights because they're that close. And so people start rowing toward the light because they're saying, this ship's going to come in and save you. It's going to, it'll be here soon. Now, on the other side is the Mount Temple. And the Mount Temple is commanded by Captain Lord or Captain Moore. And they've come very, very close now. They're getting very close to Titanic. Because remember, they, they got the signal first. And they're almost there to the ice field. Now, at 1225, Carpathia, commanded by Captain Rostrum, gets the message. Now, he's 50 miles away, but what does he do? He takes all the heat from the ship. Now, these are reciprocating steam engines. So the more steam you have, the faster these ships go. Okay. He takes away all the heat, all the steam from the entire ship and puts them in the engines. And Carpathia's go faster than it was ever designed. And he sets up a hospital room in the dining room. He sets up a triage. He puts extra lookouts out. He uncovers the lifeboats. And he flips the ship around and goes full speed for Titanic dodging between icebergs. He's known as the electric spark. He's energetic. He's religious. He says a prayer before he takes off because he's going to rescue his ship to try and get there. Now, on top of one of Maker's department store in Manhattan sits a guy named David Sarnoff. He's a 20-something. One day I'll start RCA. But right now he's just working for Wanamaker's and Wanamaker's has uh, wireless telegraphy because it's a gizmo, and it's kind of cool for customers to go send a message. Okay. They tell Sarnas to sit up there and don't do anything. He does. His headset goes off, and he hears the strange signals. He deciphers them, and it's Titanic. And it says, come quickly, we're sinking. Those signals from Titanic bounced all the way into Manhattan because, again, the ionosphere can go 2,000 miles, so it goes all the way in. David Sarnoff takes that message and runs and tells a little rag of a newspaper called the New York Times that the Titanic is sinking. Now, this technology, this new technology, this wireless telegraphy, is very cheap. People, A lot of kids can use it and get into it, and they do. Up and down the eastern seaboard, kids have little sets and they string up their, their wire and see what they can pick up. Okay. So these four boys in New Jersey, of all places, right? Four boys in New Jersey um, get together every few nights and see what they can pick up. Okay, their parents have gone to bed. They're upstairs. They're in the kitchen. And they've strung a wire up on the roof. All right. And they just see what they can pick up. And they get these strange signals. And they decipher it. And they find out it's from Titanic. It says, we've struck an iceberg. Come quickly, CQD, SOS. They're also using the new SOS signal. They run and tell their parents. Their parents come down and say, no, 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 no. You did not get a message from Titanic, you know, thousands of miles out on the Atlantic Ocean. And by the way, Titanic's unsinkable. So it's impossible that it's sinking. Well, the next day it proves they're right. And it's in the newspapers. And that's how I found out about it because in the New Jersey newspaper from 1912, there's these stories of these boys who got together and heard Titanic first. But this is happening all down the Eastern Seaboard because this new technology, nobody quite understands it. Nobody has solidified it, centralized it. And so these signals are binging all over the place and people are picking them up. So in a way, it's the first real-time tragedy. Now, on the California, Captain Lord has gone to bed. 
and he leaves these 30 somethings up there on the bridge. And these guys have been watching this strange ship with all these lights, and they think it might be Titanic, but it looks really strange in the water. So they call Captain Lord and they say, Hey, listen, there's this strange ship out there, and it looks really odd, and we think it might be Titanic. So he comes up and looks. And he goes, that's not Titanic. That's not Titanic. That's a Russian fishing trawler fishing illegally. And he goes back down to his, his suite, his berth. And then they see this strange ship they keep watching shoot off rockets. Now, rockets at sea mean one thing. Come quickly, distress. That's it. That's all it means. Doesn't matter what color it is. So they call Lord again. And they say, sir, sorry to bother you, but... That ship is now shooting off rockets. And Lord says, well, what color are the rockets? And they said, well, they're white. He goes, let me know if it changes. And that's it. And again, it doesn't matter what color the rockets are. Now, Carpathia is still coming full speed, dodging around icebergs again, risking everything to get there. Carpathia is coming so fast that all the passengers who are now freezing because they've diverted all the steam are out in the hallways and they believe Carpathia is on fire. Why? Because when ships at this time would catch fire, they'd take a run for the shore and beach as, if they could. Okay, to just, you know, save themselves, try and get people off the ship. So they think Carpathia is taking a run for the shore, right? That she's going to full speed because she's on fire. Um, and Because they don't want to tell them if they're going to Titanic. But, you know, they're coming as fast as they can. So the first class passengers, though, in the 20 lifeboats, that's all there are, there's 18 lifeboats and two what's called collapsibles. They're just rowing away trying to get to that ship with the light, which is Captain Lord, but they can never get close to it. So they come back and sort of circle Titanic. And they're sort of watching this ship invert itself like a giant skyscraper because, you know, it's still the dynamos are going, so it's all lit up. Now, we know in the movie we see some pandemonium, but the truth is, the truth is that the steerage passengers, the third class, the 1,500 people or so, are down below deck. And they don't really know what's going on. Um, the stewards tell the first class, hey, come get in a lifeboat. Uh, there might be some problems. Down in the, the lower parts of the ship, maybe a steward yells down the hallway. Most of these people can't speak English. They're immigrants, um, and they can't find their way up. When they finally do find their way up, they find out that most of the boats are gone. And panic and, you know, a riot actually breaks out. And we know now from letters later that 12 people were shot, actually, on Titanic, trying to keep order. But there was no order to be kept because these people realized they were going into the Atlantic that there were no boats left for them at this point. Now, at 2 a.m., Captain Smith comes down to the wireless room and tells Jack Bride and um, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, you've done your duty, it's every man for himself. And he releases them. If you, you know, at a point, you just go try and save yourself. But these two wireless operators say, nope, we're going to stay where we are because we still believe we might find somebody who's close enough to save us. And so they do. The power's still on, and they don't get out. Even the water's coming into the wireless room at this point, and the ship is at a 45-degree angle. Now, on the far side of the ice field, Captain Moore approaches the ice field, and he's told the passengers, do not go up top, whatever you do. Do not go up top. But some passengers have some drinks, and they go up top anyway. They open the door. It's bitterly cold, and they see this. They see this ship sinking, shooting rockets. And they're astounded. This is the Titanic, and it's right there. It's within four or five miles of it. And the crew is astounded. Because Captain Moore is not going in. He will not go into the ice field. And the crew threatens to mutiny unless he goes in, and he still won't do it. He says he does not want to risk his ship, even though it was in four miles. Now, Captain Lord 
on the California has been called up several times. Even though there's rockets going on, he tells the men, that's not Titanic. I don't know what ship it is, but that's not Titanic, and we are not going into the ice field. So basically, he goes back down and goes to bed. Meanwhile, Captain Rostrum is still coming as fast as he can, full speed. Now the Titanic is sinking. Um, and the first class passengers are just basically in a big circle around the ship watching it go down. And the officers on the California, they watch Titanic simply disappear. Um, you know, at a great distance, they just see it go down. It looks like it just sort of slides down into the water. Even as people are still rowing toward the light, it never comes closer because the California is drifting. It's drifting because there's no power. And the people on the Mount Temple, they watch as Captain Moore pulls back from the ice field and starts going parallel. And they just can't believe it, that he won't go in. Now, here comes the worst part of Titanic. At 2.20 a.m., she breaks in half. We know this now because we found her on the floor. And also there were reports that she'd broken in half. But also it's amazing why people said she didn't break in half. But we know she did. And why is that? Well, because of the massive amount of weight it would be like a skyscraper in birding, was never meant to be supported at a 45 degree angle and the steel just breaks. Uh, they said that the rumbling, the roar of everything falling through the ship, that's basically what happened, was just like a continual roar because everything in this ship, all its contents are just bashing through bulkheads and, and collapsing down into the front of the ship falling back as she falls back again as she breaks in, in two. Now, 1,500 people hit the water at the same time as Titanic goes down. This is a doll. It's on the bottom of the ocean, Atlantic Ocean from Titanic. Now, they aren't, they aren't drowning. They're freezing to death because it's so cold. Second officer, Light Taller, will later say, who was also in the water, it's like a thousand knives going into your body. The water's so cold, all right? And the people in the lifeboats, remember I showed you those big lifeboats, how big they were, right? Okay. They're all in a big circle watching this, and they see all these people thrashing around in the water, 1,500 people. And they later said it sounded like locusts on a summer night, or in a ball game where the ball gets hit. Um, mostly people are yelling out, I love you, back and forth. Now, these boats, these lifeboats, these 20 boats are all half-loaded. Why? Because nobody knew how to load these ship, these lifeboats. They never worked together, and they're first-class people. So some had nine people in boats that are designed for 75 people. So there is a lot of room. There's actually room for 400 more people in these boats. But nobody goes back. Why? Because some people say, we've got to go back and save these people. And the other people say, you want to die too? You want to get swamped? We're going to die too if you go back. And so an unsinkable Molly Brown made a reputation by saying, we've got to go back. All right. But only one boat would eventually go back. So, and think about how big those boats were, how reinforced, how high they set in water. It would have been almost impossible to swamp those boats. You could have pulled people in, but to think that this boat's going to be overturned by people was just not realistic. But again, only one boat went back, grabbed four people. The rest of the people froze to death. Now, at 3.30 a.m., Carpathia reaches the site where Titanic was, but she's gone. All right, so for, she's an hour late. Now, this is a colorized photo of one of the Inglehart, uh collapsible boats, and people have been offloaded into it. So this one's full. But everybody's so cold in these boats from sitting in the Atlantic that they don't have the strength to get, get into the Carpathia. So what happens? Carpathia opens up the side hall and starts to pull people in where they usually would bring in all the baggage and, and all the goods that they're transporting. And they start pulling people up, all right? So, and also, by the way, the Atlantic, which has been very calm, is now starting to kick up. So it's really not a moment to lose. Now, there's a little girl on the uh, Carpathia with a browning camera, and she takes some photos. And here's one. She leans over. Now, look at this life bed. This is the way most of them work. 
there's hardly anybody in it. Look at those people look darn cold, but there's barely anybody in that boat right there. That's a big lifeboat, right? Now here's another photo of people on board. Now Lawrence Beasley, a schoolmaster, said later in his book, nobody said a word on Carpathia. Why? Because everybody realized their husbands had just died. Remember, women and children first. These women knew their husbands were gone, pretty much. Now, the whole world wants to talk to this guy, Harold Brown. Why? Because he knows the story of Titanic. Now, Jack Phillips dies when Titanic goes down. Harold Bride survives under an overturned lifeboat, um, but his feet are frozen blocks of ice. Terrible frostbite. And when he's pulled onto Carpathia, he passes out. But they wake him up. Why? Because the wireless operator on board Carpathia is exhausted. And he can no longer transmit. And Harold is the only person who knows Marconi and Morse code. And so he's pulled into service. And one of the first messages he gets is from Google and Marconi as boss. And he sends him a message. He says, listen, don't talk to anybody. Don't tell anybody about what's going on. Because I've arranged for you to talk to New York Times. You can get $5,000 to give them your story. And so Harold Bride doesn't tell anybody what's going on. Even the president who wants to know, he is an information blackout. So now the California finally wakes up. They wake up the uh, Marconi operator. He confirms Titanic sunk. Uh, Captain Lord says, I still need confirmation. They give him confirmation. And even then, he doesn't go straight into the ice field. He goes around it. Now, Carpathia reaches New York with the survivors. And they hit the bay, New York's bay, and, and it's pandemonium. There's all these reporters on boats throwing money literally at the boat. They're telling survivors, jump overboard. We'll pay you anything you want for your story. Um, some try and climb on the boat. They have to get thrown off because um, everybody wants to know what happened. So after they drop off the lifeboats at the White Star dock, the lifeboats, they're on Carpathia from Titanic. But they pulled on board. They didn't get them all, but they got a lot of them. Um, and that's a picture we saw. They head over and they dock. And people start coming up. But Guglielmo Marconi is the first one who goes on board. And this is where my book begins, is right as Carpathia is pulling up. And he goes right to the wireless room where Harold Bride's working. He says, your, your job is done. And he has him carried off the ship. All right, here he is. See his feet? Just awful frostbite. And he's taken directly to a hotel where he meets with New York Times reporters and gives him the scoop of the century. Because nobody really knows what has happened to them now. There are rumors that Titanic survived, that Titanic got towed to Nova Scotia and actually White Star chartered a train to go there to take the uh, survivors, the, the, the relatives of the people on board. And they had to turn the train around and they realized it wasn't true. But a lot of a lot of newspapers said, you know, a lot of people survived. Titanic did not sink. The New York Times was the only paper that took a took a position and said Titanic had sunk with great loss of life. They took a big risk, and then they get the scoop of the century. Now the California pulls in, and Captain Lord says to everybody, "Look, don't talk to anybody because we're going to do a turnaround and get out of here." But everybody does talk to people. They talk to reporters. And this hits the papers. California refused to aid the Titanic. Distress rockets, uh, plainly visible at the time, says engineer. Captain Lord makes denial. Okay, so what happened? The passengers and the crew talked to reporters and said, we saw it. The Titanic was right there. And, and Captain Lord refused to go in and help. Still, Lord wants to escape, but he gets pulled into the American investigation. Which is, which is launched right away. And so they don't let him leave. And he has to testify, and he tries to talk his way out of it. But, you know, they say, well, did you see the rockets? And he said, yeah, I saw the rockets, but they were white. 
And they say, does that matter? And he says, no. And they convict him of not coming to the aid of Titanic and saving countless lives, which, again, he's disgraced. Britain actually has the same uh, type of investigation, and they convict him as well. So he's disgraced for all time, stripped of his title. Now, Captain Moore was also at the investigation, but for some reason, history game will buy. I mean, later books would come out and they'd say, and Moore later said, he said, I didn't see Titanic, but if I had seen it, I wouldn't have gone to the ice field because I, I wasn't going to risk my ship. So he wanted it both ways. In the newspapers, they still came out with disinformation like, Captain Smith saying, I'll follow ship. Captain Smith just disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to him. There were stories of him saving babies, telling men, good luck, man, God be with you. And he didn't do any of that. He just disappeared. But again, if you look down here, thrilling story by Titanic surviving wireless man. So for a while, Harold Bride was the most famous man in the world. Why? Because he's the only one who knew what really happened. And so he told his story and it, it went all over the world. Captain Rostrum, he got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He got medals from women's groups. He got medals from the British. Why? Because he acted the way we all hoped we would act um, in this situation. He was the hero of the hour. So when we go through to Titanic, really Titanic's a story that, you know, it was told a certain way, and this really began with A Night to Remember, Walter Lord's book, um, where, you know, the, the sort of mythology is built up there of this was a preordained event that could not have been, have been averted. But the truth is, 1,178 people could have been saved in those light bins, but only 706 were loaded on. So 400 more could have been saved there. And the 1,500 people who drowned in the Atlantic, a lot of them couldn't have been saved if Captain Lord had come in or Captain Moore had come in. And, help, and tried to rescue people. And, you know, it's interesting that as of this writing, they have a plan to go down and pluck the wireless room off from the bottom of the Atlantic and bring it up. And there's hope that you know, some sort of energy will still be in these coils. And if there was, certainly one of the last messages that they would have there would be the plea that they sent out, which again, when you change it from a CQD or an SOS. It's just a basic plea, really. And that was, will you come help us? And that's the same eternal plea we have today. And this final slide is the embalming ship that went back to get the bodies. And by the way, most of the bodies were lost. The currents took them away. And uh, the bodies that they could get, they took to Nova Scotia, where there's a Titanic cemetery today.